who to treat, who not to treat. Well, let's divide this into categories. Um, motility, which we're going to start off with, just laying your hand, trying to feel some cranial rhythm, getting close to their maker and yours. You can do that to anybody, unless they have some skin condition that doesn't allow you to put pressure. I can't think of someone I wouldn't do motility to. Mobility, yeah, you have lots of contraindications. Okay, let's start off with mild, moderate, severe. Everything doesn't have to be nuclear. You start off light, you find out what the patient can tolerate. My contraindications would be very similar, maybe this identical to what you know as a PT as far as you putting pressure around their abdomen. You feel some something large on the left side. Are you supposed to diagnose splenomegaly? No. Are you supposed to diagnose it? No. Not. But you do have an ethical obligation. You have a patient, you know them. This just feels large and weird. Okay. If I miss that, again, got to buy a Lamborghini in a vacation home somewhere. Okay. Because my license says you don't miss that. But when I f feel this, I. I send them to someone else for to rule it out. You figure it out. Okay, I don't, I'm not doing general medicine in that sense. I send them back to their family doctor. Hey, you're, you're taking care of them on a daily basis. Go send them for a scan. Looks like fundamentally to me. So I would never touch them. They could have nothing wrong with them and just walking from here to there, just, just drop over and die. So if you're the last one to touch them, you'll get blamed for it. Um, there's other things, but they would all require you to make a diagnosis. Okay, I wouldn't do it on someone with a triple A, okay, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, we're told not to do it with metastases. These are all things that are not in your scope of practice to put the DX on. So it's actually a lot easier for you than it is for me. You work in whatever your comfort zone, the moment you're out of your comfort zone, you're not sure they just had a surgery or something like that. Say, I want to use some mild, moderate pressure on your belly. Ask your doctor if that's okay. Very luckily, the doctor will say, yep, and then you're free to do whatever you want to do, because they have to rule out the other big pathologies. You don't. Um, yeah, don't say, uh, ask your doctor if I can do a liver lift. <laughs> I can give you what the doctor's answer is right now. No, and get another therapist. <laughs> Told you people, you talk to people and things they don't understand, they're like, what the hell is that? What are you even thinking of doing? Well, what I'm do thinking of doing is using mild, or actually I'm using moderate or heavy pressure in your abdomen. They might not object to that. Okay, so how does it work? Um, we're going to use reflex arcs. Let's take reflex arcs we're all pretty familiar with. Um, but can I ask questions? No. <laughs> of course you may ask a question. Sorry? Of course you may ask a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Sir, if we are treating on, I mean, we are giving osteopathy on the visceras, so, like, if the patient is having hepatomegaly, so we are just relieving the symptoms, or we can, we are able to reduce the enlargement also. I'm going to make a tape recording of my lectures so that I can play them back for you no. during your sleep. You'd, that's okay. There's one part of it I didn't answer and part of it I did answer. I don't have the expectation that by me doing any kind of visceral, they're, I'm going to do a liver panel and you know all their liver enzymes are going to change. I can't prove that. I don't know that anyone has. But who has hepatomegaly? What kind of patient has hepatomegaly? Alcoholic. Anyone else? Uh, jaundice. Anyone else? Hepatitis. Hepatitis. Anyone else? It's probably a quarter of America. Ah, <laughs> the junk. Probably a quarter of America. Okay. I'm an I'm an occasional drinker. Last night I drank an inordinate proportion of alcohol because he made me. Okay, but that's about three times a year for me. I had four drinks last night. I'd be, I'd be starting off when I was 17. But no, I didn't. I actually didn't, never taste alcohol until I was 22. Four drinks would be just a, like an aperitif before we go out and get drunk. So I'm an occasional drinker. I don't use any drugs. And uh, I've been really sick in my life. And every other year at my physical, my liver's 
a little bit below the costal margin, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's below. Always one of my liver enzymes is off. My genetics, I come from a family where people live to be 105, 102, and I have this fear that my mother's going to outlive me <laughs> because she's making me absolutely insane. So I am a reasonably healthy guy, and my liver at times, it's, it's at some stage of hepatomegaly. And in America, it's quite common. People go to work, they come back, they drink, they're gonna have a six pack of Budweiser. Canadians, I think they're, they're bigger drinkers than we are. So, if I ruled out doing this to people with hepatomegaly, I'd be ruling out just a ton of patients. So I'm doing it to them. Now, if you're talking about hepatomegaly in the hospital, and you're gonna do this if you're working in hospital, I wouldn't do anything like that without consulting your doctor. And the consultation will be, I want to use some moderate pressure on the abdomen, is it okay? Because they have hepatomegaly in the, in the books, because they're written by lawyers, they'll say it's a contraindication. I'm, I'm doing it all the time. Okay, and one more question. Is this a temporary relief? Like if the patient is having frozen shoulder uh, and uh, he had been to a physiotherapy many a times and then uh, actually I did one of the patient uh, having frozen shoulder and I lifted the liver and at the same day it was like a whole range came up but after 10 days he came again with the same problem and every time when I liver, lift his liver it is okay and then again uh, after a few days he come with the same problem. Don't worry the shirt's staying on. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting warm. So, what's the answer to her question? I think you know what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. You don't? You're completely clueless. <laughs> what am I going to say? That's not what I was going to say. What am I going to say? Too early in the world for you. Maybe. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> That's the answer right there. I, I, didn't, I don't know. Um, I can tell you based on just my own you know, years of experience, you give me a certain condition, what's the chance of me getting better? I would spit out statistics to you that occur to me, what I've seen. <laughs> But generally speaking, I cannot make that prediction. How long is it going to last? And and you should. And if you're not sure because you're starting out with this and it's new, you want to give them that answer. I hope you feel better today. Hey, doc, how long is it going to last? I don't know. Uh, let's just see how you feel. Come in next week. Let's do a treatment again. He comes in next week. Says I still feel pretty good. Okay, do your treatment because he came in and say, let's check with me in three weeks, like that, and you're going to find out. Some people, you're going to do something now, you're not going to see them again. Mm -hmm. you got, no, let me actually, finish. whenever I do liver lift, if he comes after 10 days or 15 days, just uh, within two sec the five, uh, 10 seconds or I should say 20 seconds, he's able to lift his hand freely. But with the same problem, he comes again after 10 days or maybe 15 days. Right, but that's this one case this one particular case. So you're asking me how long will it last in him? So I asked him to go for some uh, some doctor and go your liver check. Mm, maybe he used to drink a lot. <laughs> yeah, but he, he left, he left, yes, he told me. Okay, all right, there's a number of factors here. How old is the guy? Uh, around 55. Okay, so I have a video in you. I forgot for the love of God, don't play it. <laughs> okay. Fifty-five years old. You said he used to drink a lot, but he doesn't anymore. Yeah. When he stopped drinking a lot. Maybe four, five months back, he left. Okay, so he's a drinker. He was Let's still drink. call him a drinker. Yeah. Okay, a guy who's got a lot of alcohol. Uh, hepatomegaly isn't going to go away because he stopped four or five weeks ago, or months ago. Or whatever so let me just make this a lot simpler but generally speaking I don't know whether it's going to be today you got your magic whether we've got to titrate it over time that's how I figure it out come back next week if you got no problem don't come back you got a little bit of a problem come back we'll treat you 
I don't schedule for a month. You're feeling fine? Don't schedule it for a month. You know, come back whenever. Don't. I'm not going to look at it. I just, I'm going to close my eyes when you show. Na 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 na. It's not going to help me. It's not going to change my answer. So either you hit the wall with this patient, and I might have the same problem. You get some temporary relief, come back, and, and you. And then you, you say to the patient, I've done what I had to do. It seems that this is working for a short period of time. And that's what I, I'm able to do for you. If you want me to, to do that for you every so often, you decide. Or you try another therapy. <laughs> you know, I had a lady when I'm in the hospital, when I was a, graduated. So I'm a new doctor doing this crap job in the hospital, and everybody has to do their history and physicals. Students have to do it, the interns have to do it, uh, I have to do it for the family doc who's going to come in tomorrow after they've had a good night's sleep. All ask the same questions. And I get this old lady, she's a black woman, she's in her 80s. She's in for, I'll tell you what she, what she was in for. I said, uh, why are you here? I got some vagina in my hop. Excuse me? I got some vagina in my hop. I didn't ask a third time because I know what her problem is. What's her problem? Does she have a vagina in her heart? <laughs> or does she have angina? <laughs> <laughs> We would hear this. This was a common in uh, poor people and like these kind of areas. I heard this lots of times. I got fireballs in the Eucharist. What is that? You got any medical problems? I got guts, fireballs in the Eucharist. What is it? Fibroid to me. Fibroid. Who said it? Did you say it? Sorry. Put tape over your mouth. <laughs> he knows me too well. Yeah, fibroid uterus. Fireballs in the Eucharist. <laughs> Anyway, I'm seeing this lady because she's got a vagina in her heart. <laughs> one here, one here. And I said, uh, we'll get to the rest of the social history. Do you smoke? No. She's 87 years old. Do you smoke? No. Do you ever smoke? Yeah. What'd you quit? I ain't smoking no more. Like, now she quit. <laughs> Because she's in for the 47th time in the hospital, she swears to me she's quitting. Mm. And in her mind, she considers herself a non-smoker. Mm, yes. She does. Yes, yes, yes. I quit. So it's all gone. 100,000 years of smoking is gone. <laughs> so this is the part that i like to have fun with you about the psychology, and it's going to help you in osteopathy. Understanding, we're talking to honest and crazy people. And there's people where we do limited treatment, we get some, he's getting limited benefit from you, which is better than no benefit. Maybe we'll learn some more tricks today that will help you to get him a little bit further. Yeah. But I can never make a prediction, so that's why I always say, let's do a couple of treatments, see where we're at. Never ask them at the end of treatment, how did today's session go? <laughs> okay, because today's session is <laughs> over. <laughs> Let's talk about reflex arcs that you all know. Grandmas, we think grandma's having a heart attack. What are, give me one symptom. And if you say, if he says anything, pillow over the face. <laughs> give me one symptom of, that we think grandma's having a heart attack. Uh, pain, chest pain. Chest pain. Chest pain. Chest pain. pain. Yes. What, do they, what do they say? Uh, they say they I have say chest pain. I have a, no, I have a burning. Uh, heaviness. Some, uh, sometimes they say heaviness. 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 So heaviness. See, I feel like I have elephants sitting on my chest. I can't yes. get my breath. Yes. Good. Give me another one. Tingling down the left arm. Left arm tingling. Tingling. Can be Tingling. all the way down. Can be down to the hand. Give me something else. Upper back. Upper back pain. 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 Excellent. Give me another one. Pain between the rhomboids. Yeah. Pain between the rhomboids. Upper back between the rhomboids. Give me another one. Sometimes vomit. Sweating. 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 Vomit. Sweating. Vomit. Sweating. 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 Diaphoretic. That's autonomic. And that can be autonomic. Mm -hmm. uh, give me another one. Dizziness. Uh, they might have vertigo. 
um, not as common, but they might. Jaw pain. Jaw pain, pain. yes. Okay. yes so, pain. anyway, they got all these things going on. Is there something wrong with their left arm? Left arm? <laughs> <laughs> Is there something wrong with the left arm? No. No. Not no. Uh, are they sweating because the room became hot? No. 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 Okay, why are they sweating? It is an autonomic response. Why is it autonomic responding? Is it fear? Why is it? Well, you're correct Vegas. about that. I don't want to say that. Vegas. 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 Okay, let's break it down. What's actually the pathophysiology of a heart attack? Give me three words to describe a heart attack. It is uh, myocardial. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just tell you because I think you're, you're not, I'm not being clear. Mm. There's something that causes ischemia. Yes. Is it yes. thrombus or they had a spasm? Yes. Something causes lack of blood flow. Yes. Lack of blood flow results in lack of oxygen to oxygen. tissues. Lack of oxygen to tissues results in necrosis. Mm -hmm. Ischemia, hypoxia, necrosis. Same thing would happen with the lady with the hot dog coming out of her butt. Okay. You, you kill the blood flow, no oxygen, t cells immediately begin to die. That goes back to the spinal cord, releases bradykinins, leukotrienes, uh, prostaglandins, histamines, substance P, and a bunch of other stuff I forget yes. from medical school. Okay, it all goes back to the cord, and that, that super stimulus of the cord goes straight up the cord and a little bit down. A little bit down is why they vomit or their stomach bothers them. Yes. Going up, it's like the, the man running through the hotel telling the hotel, knocking on all the doors, saying there's a fire, there's a fire, there's a fire, but he's on fire. Mm. So the stimulus is going up and, and everything's getting stimulated. Um, we can use that backwards. So we know that your organs, does, does the person having a heart attack have heart pain? No, no, they do not have pain. The heart doesn't have pain sensation. Yes, okay, so organs respond to two things cell death mm. and proprioception. Yes. So I can use that pathway backwards by lifting your liver and moving something. <clears throat> it's such an unusual feeling. It goes back to the cord, mostly up, a little bit down, and it can override somatic signals, other muscle spasms, other things that are going on, either temporarily, so maybe your other techniques will work, or maybe for a longer term. That's how we're gonna use it in treatment. I saw a lot of people in the um, in the hospital when I was doing that night job, the low doctor job. My job is to sit upstairs and watch old reruns of Gilligan's Island, and then if they call me, I got to run down and get the shock paddles out, or I can just from the phone I can just order sleeping pills. But I like to walk around, talk to people. I'd walk around. My job isn't to find the heart attack before it comes. My job is actually when it's there. That's what I'm there to get called for at night. And uh, I remember one time nurses called me because I was friendly with everybody. And I would, some people would yell and scream if it will disturb their TV watching. I wouldn't. So I said, can you take a look at this guy? Um, the guy's had four heart attacks. He's in for something related to his heart. He's on telemetry. He's on a monitor. <coughs> you know, strips coming out. Ding, 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 ding. I walk in, she's got good clinical hunches, so she asked me to take a look at him. It's not my job, it's his day, day doctor's job. I walk in, I said, hey, how you doing, sir? Great! He's all pasty white looking, but you know, a thousand years old. He's happy. Um, feel any pain anywhere? Nope! Any problems breathing? No. Feel good. Feel good. <laughs> she had no symptoms, nothing. She just said, something don't look right with him. This is part of your artistic world, so you can invade your scientific world. I said, yeah, I don't know, he doesn't look right. There's like an old crusty guy about to die, but that's because of his age. Let's throw a 12 lead on him. This one that goes, the one strip that comes out, this misses a lot of stuff. Let's throw a 12 lead on him, you know, the big page. We put that on him. Start taking everything down. I'm helping the nurses put up. You're, you're getting moved, buddy. Because what's going on? I said, welcome to your fifth heart attack. Okay? <laughs> and we're moving. This is the wrong room for you. I'm starting. 
started to put nitro in the bag and started to do emergency procedures for him. Because of her, I didn't save his life. She did. Because if 10 minutes later, I would have been down there. He would have been like this, throw up all over the bed. It would have been code blue. But he made her, something didn't feel right to her. I want you to be scientists, but everything we're doing is feeling. She said, he don't look right. And she, she asked me, do you think he doesn't look right? I said, yeah, he don't look right. He threw a 12 weeks. This had to literally be two minutes before he would have felt crushing chest pain. We picked it up with a 12 lead. So he never experienced the pain, actually. He didn't get why we're moving him out of that unit onto the CCU floor. So those hunches, those things that we feel that out in the psychic phenomena tell us something. But we can use visceral somatic, common visceral somatic reflexes. We can use them backwards to change physical pain and visceral problems. We can use visceral technique to undo a lot of people's IBS. Um, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, what is that, by the way? Um, What's the definition? Um, constipation followed by diarrhea, diarrhea followed by constipation. That it's it? It's the same thing. Is that it? That's it's, what it's, I know. it's constipation, it's constipation yeah. or diarrhea, yeah. one or the other or both plus abdominal pain, pain yes. and in the West, a negative colonoscopy. In other countries, maybe they're not doing the colonoscopy. Because Colon the other reasons for it would be Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, tumor. So we say, we don't know why you have it. You just have it. These people can be fixed. These people can be fixed. Okay, a little bit longer. I'll give you a break after I get done this. I got a few more slides I got to do. So this is what we typically see in all of our anatomy books. Uh, we see all the important stuff, and the rest we assume are, are air particles or from the negative universe or just, no. Everything is moving against everything. Everything is different densities, okay? Here's a, what is that? Vertebrae. What are these? Kidneys. Kidneys. Aorta. Superior mesenteric vessel. Pancreas. Pancreas liver, gallbladder, everything here is doing something and moving against something. Nothing is air. There's no air floating around there. When there's air floating around there under the diaphragm, surgical emergency. Okay, that was something that I had to look at when people were status post-surgery and not feeling well. We do three flat plates on them. If I see air under the diaphragm, you're going right back into surgery. What's that mean? I wouldn't expect you to know this. I'm just going to take you a little further. What's air under the diaphragm mean? Means you got a hole somewhere. Yes. You got a hole from your outside world into your inside world. Okay. So you had some surgery done. Someone popped a hole through one of your hoster or, or somewhere. You. Anytime you take something in from the outside world, you eat something for the time, you eject it. Mm. Okay. Your immune system is there everywhere. When you breathe in air, so you're breathing in and blowing it out. You're taking from the outside world, which has lots of stuff you don't want. We eat food that has lots of stuff we don't want. So your immune system is everywhere where the outside world touches your inside world. You poke a hole through those two and you have a communication. First thing that happens is the bowel shut down. It'll go, it'll go quiet because everything is like now starting to get infected. Having said that, I caught somebody that had bowel sounds that had a perforation. Because I'm that dude. <laughs> I suspected it, I ordered the test, the hospital did it 14 hours later. <laughs> I ordered the stat test, he lost his entire colon, managed to live long enough to sue the, the beans out of the hospital for, I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars. And they deserve to be sued for millions and millions of dollars. I got grilled by the attorneys. What did you do and when did you do it? I did the right thing, the hospital didn't. They let him sit for 14 hours with a perforation. And he had bowel sounds. But what I learned in school, there should be nothing. We're told to listen 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. 30. No one does that. Uh, 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 uh. That's good. He had sounds. But he had a football growing out of his, he was a fat guy, but it looked like a football growing out of his stomach. Well, that ain't right. That's why I ordered the tests. 
Never ignore my hunches. Never, when you have that feeling something's wrong, it's something's coming and telling you. If you're not sure, engage another practitioner. You know, go to your family doctor. I've sent people to the family doctor, neurologist, and they've said, oh, there's nothing wrong with them. <clears throat> you're fine. No patient has ever been mad at me for sending them upstairs, you know, upgrading. So I'm doing it out of, uh, I don't want to miss something, taking care of you. I don't know everything. I know almost everything. Okay. If I don't send them and there's a problem, I've never had anyone get angry because I'm overcautious. You know what? You say to your patient, I think we're okay here, but I just want to make sure. Let your family doc take a look at you. I'd like to do X, Y, and Z. That show that you care about them. Um, bowels. First surgery. I told you I thought I wanted to be a surgeon. My whole fantasy died in that several hours. You've seen this picture. You guys do cadaver? You guys do cadaver, right? Are you, are you do partake in like live surgeries? Yes. Yes, yeah, they split this open and and I'm thinking, that shit's never going back in. I don't know how the surgery's gonna end because I don't know how it goes back in. It's like too much stuff that came out of the bag. And you've heard these stories. They left a pair of scissors in my grandma. Uh, you, you heard stories like this, right? How, how do you leave scissors in somebody? I could lose my sandal in somebody and not find it. <laughs> they did used to lose stuff in people. Um, in the time when I was joining medicine, they had mostly solved that problem. Because when they're doing a bowel surgery, they take four centimeter by four, I don't know, centimeters or inches, they're big pads to soak up the juice, which is all <coughs> over the place, when they're cotton and whatever. So it's pad, 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 pad. And I've seen them put 60 pads in somebody. 60 goes in, 60's gotta come out, not 59. Because they don't get an infection. And they used to leave stuff in people. No. There's, a, there's a drawer full of scissors, scissors, hemostat, hemostat. You know, they got a bunch of hemostats all over the place. So the way they fixed that problem with the pads was they had a wall in the OR like this. And there's a little button, and in that little home is one pad. So every time he asks for a pad, she unbuttons it, one pad. And every little home has to have a little pad in it when they're done. And I watched the surgeon spend 10 minutes flopping guts around the air is this big. Yeah. Ten minutes looking between. Oh, here it is. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, it's amazing that this doesn't. Um, you don't get like a volvulus. You don't get a. Uh, you don't get a, some kind of twist that. If you twist it, you cut off the blood supply. Six to eight hours to figure that problem out. How's that not happen here? Why is it not protected by bones? Well, what's supposed to happen here? What's the action here? Peristalsis, motion, right? So we need motion. Well, the way you have that without getting twisted up is you have a root of the mesentery, okay? And this is really strong, tough material. So that actually, it looks like they're all free to do whatever they want. No, they're free to do a little dance in a small area so they don't, so they don't overlap their neighbors. So the mesentery is holding them all at different heights. So it's quite unusual for you to get, it's something that happens in children. It can happen in childbirth and they can have some anomaly, they can get a volvulus, which is a rotation and then that's a surgical emergency. And I'm told that I'm not a dog owner, but Great Danes apparently have a very loose bowel and you're not supposed to run them a lot because their bowels, they, they, I'm told by veterinarians, they can, they can get a volvulus and they'll, they'll die from it. Okay, let's look at the relationships of organs. This is retroperitoneal. Okay, so here's that peritoneum. We're seeing some things are in front, some things are behind. The peritoneum is like being a bed sheet. So anything under the bed sheet, not gonna move a whole lot. Things in front of the bed sheet, they're gonna move a whole lot. So your kidneys aren't really peristaltic. We can make that argument about it, some people will, but it's, they're not really peristaltic, not like uh, the small bowel. And so they're protected because they're very far back in the peritoneum. Um, your pancreas is half in, half out. Okay, it dies around the peritoneum and comes out. Spleen here, it's very far retrolateral. That's why I say if you feel something on the left side, some big odd bulge, I wouldn't even touch him. I wouldn't even touch him. Send him to the family doc, 
have you always had this bulge here? No, you know, it just came up a few months ago. I don't know what the hell that is. Go, go let your family doc check it out. Um, because it's, it's very far retrolateral. You should never be palpating a spleen. When we do a lift on the left side, it's gonna be for the stomach, not the spleen. Um, if we're doing manipulation in the abdominal cavity, probably as a general rule, you're gonna help their blood flow. You're gonna help the major vessel to be a little bit less impeded. You're absolutely gonna affect their lymphatic flow. And when we get to lymph, if we haven't done it already, I don't know if we are, did we do lymph already? Yes. Yeah. We did it? Yes. Yeah, okay. So working, working centrally here and just getting the whole system moving is, is better than particular techniques. Um, anything you do to the diaphragm, things we did in lymphatics, MFR, uh, we'll have some other ideas for diaphragm on day three here. Anything that gets us moving better just helps reduce the tension in the abdomen. Um, here's peristalsis. Um, this is always moving, always. There's no point at which it should ever be quiet. If it's quiet, there's a problem. And this is just showing what's happening at the uh, gastric antrum. We're separating different areas from different, from acid, from alkali. There's a whole process going on as things develop. Um, there's three things that, that stimulate your peristalsis. One is local. You put something in, the area expands, and uh, your sympathetic nervous system, your vagal nervous system is gonna have that contract. You put it there, it contracts. That's how you know you gotta go. If you have to have a bowel movement in the toilet, the way you know is your rectum starts to expand to the point where you, that's your signal you gotta go. Um, so there is local nerve response. There's vagal nerve, autonomic nerve, vagus and splanchnic nerve response. And the last one, when you smell lunch is about ready, and your stomach goes, <laughs> it causes that. Or you could read what's on the slide. Cholecystokinin is that hungry thing, it's the hungry hormone. You smell something cooking, your stomach gets busy. Where is it coming? We're ready down here in the factory. Even in thought. In thought, smell, memory. You can have a memory of something and start CCK going. What's interesting is they have tried to play with CCK and it's always deadly. It's always deadly. I remember the last one was Redux, was a medicine to block CCK when I was a resident. Wasn't on the market for a couple of months before it got pulled. Um, hormones are really powerful in your body and trying to block them, uh, you are really messing with fire. Um, then they've done things like, I don't know if they, you have these things here, they've experimented with um, chirality of compounds. So the difference between glucose and cellulose is just the handedness of the molecule. If I drag you back painfully to, I don't think you did in high school, but you did in college probably, chemistry, chirality. I have two hands, they're exactly the same, but one's left and one's right. Same components, that's chirality. Yes. So your body recognizes that. So cellulose tastes like what it is, salad. And, sal and glucose tastes sweet, it's a question of chirality. In the 1960s when I was born, they gave women uh, thalidomide to ease nausea. And uh, a lot of people, and I, I know someone, were born with deformities from thalidomide. They were born without fingers, they were born without arms. Um, and the problem was not the thalidomide, it was either the left-handed thalidomide or the right-handed thalidomide. One of, the, one of them caused that. But they didn't really realize it's stereoisomers, your body recognizes it. So what they started doing for, for the fat, and, and people, I do, I do fall into that category, we're always waiting for that next invention where we can eat ice cream that tastes like ice cream, <laughs> that will magically not leave any mark on our body and they haven't done it. They started using the left-handed isomers or the right-handed isomers in fat molecules. I don't know if they're playing with your chips here, but they start playing with our chips in the States and they'll taste like crap. <laughs> so if you change the, the isomer, your body won't use it. So it's gonna cause what is the symptom? 
diarrhea. Yeah. If you don't use it, it's going out. If it's going out, it becomes an osmotic component. It's gonna draw water with it. That's how osmosis works. Anyway, might have been too much information for you, but.